My name's Andrew Pritchard, and today's guest is Terry Ellis. Terry, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Terry Ellis. I come from Camden Town. I've been released from prison now for four years, and I'm on your show today. And welcome on the show today, Terry. We want to talk about your life, Terry, the journey, obviously, which took you through prison. Where we want to start is this journey, where it began, where you grew up, a little bit about your parents and your background, basically. I grew up in Camden Town. It was a poverty stricken area back in the day when I was a young kid. We came from a really poor family. I was a single parent. My dad was a black cab driver, stroke arm robber. He used to visit us once every few weeks. My mum was the main breadwinner. She also had a few mental problems. She tried to commit suicide a few times and she was quite erratic with kids. Tell me, Terry, obviously, you know, you take on two things. Your mum obviously had some serious problems there, but also your dad being an armed robber. How did that yeah. influence as a young man growing up? Was you aware of what your father done? I think what it was for me is the people that we associated with. Everyone that my dad knew and we associated were all criminals. So we had people that were uh, doing the jump-ups. People I met were all old villains. We knew the Evanses, the Rileys. For some people who aren't aware, do you want to explain what a jump-up is? The jump-ups, you know, we used to go around foreign bands. So I've done it for quite a few years when I was a young kid. We'd follow vans around London, off the motorway, and we would do sign-ups. So what we would do, we'd follow them. When they'd done a delivery, we would then go and do the lock and take everything off it. Or we would follow a lorry in, and if he thought he was lost, we'd say, right, mate, where are you off to? He would then say, right, I'm going down to, uh, say, Edgware Road. I'd say, where are you going? Let's have a look. I'd say, yeah, I'll tell you what it is, brother. Straight down there, do a left, do a right. We'd send him in the wrong direction. And then we would go straight to the place we was going to deliver. And we were right outside. We have our van there, some oval clipboard. And as soon as he turns up, we would then turn around and say, fucking hell, where you been? We're going for dinner now. We're going for breakfast. And he'd go, oh, I'm on a deadline. I've got to get to the next job. And we'd say, ain't no problem, mate. And then we'd tend to walk away and say, right, listen, if you unload everything onto the floor, my guys will take it all in. So we'd unload it all for him. He'd pull away. We'd pull our van down and then chuck everything on the back. That's a called a sign-up. Traditional jump up. So, when was the first time, obviously, you know, you fill it in the criminal justice system and you got your first conviction? That's really for doing burglars. I was doing lots of warehouses, shops. Uh, I used to get in lots of trouble. My mum was a professional shoplifter. So, I used to go with her all the time. So, I got into the practice criminal at the age of uh, eight and nine years old. I then got a little group of guys. We then used to go around warehouses in Camden and then shops. I'd get nicked and that's when I went into the criminal justice system. That experience, like, what was your first sentence served? First sentence was juvenile. I went to uh, Stanford House. It was sort of a knock-on effect. First one was uh, I went into a care home, and then I got in lots of trouble and got expelled from school. So I was quite rebellious then. So I started robbing anything I could lay my hands on. So my first one, I think, you know, I was just robbing shots. I got nicked. Now I'm going to call. I got to attendance centres. As I graduated, it then became, you know, we got into sort of armed robberies. By the time I was like 15, 16 years old, you know, I was going over the counters. Like, you know, I think we'd done over 50 armed robberies by the time I was 16 years old. I was quite a bit London, and so were the guys that I was hanging around with. And we were lucky enough to have acquired a couple of uh, shotguns, sawn off shotguns. And at that age, we just believed that we could take on the world, and everything were taken. So, what was that experience of? I presume it was Borstal at that time. Had it just changed to YC? Well, no, no. What it was for me, it was Stanford House, the first one, and then the community home, and then it was Ashford. My first one was Ashford. Well, Ashford in Kent, right, OK. Yeah, quite an experience. Yeah, do you want to describe what that was like, actually, the young offending, you know, institutions back then, at that time, compared to where they are now, obviously? Walking in there was quite an experience. you got men from all different areas of young kids, and everyone's trying to process them. So it's quite a hostile environment. So you've got different areas all coming together. It's quite frightening. The people that frighten me the most were the screws. Back in them days, they were quite brutal. They were all ex-soldiers. You know, I found myself down a block quite a few times. I'm on a receiving end of quite a few beatings from them, which then made me really angry as, as a young man because, you know, the place that I went into to try and sort of change my ways really just taught me how to cover up and take the blows, you know, and just hate everyone. You know, so for me, it was a dramatic time in my life going. It was also a learning curve, you know, so I met a lot of guys from different areas that I can actually network with. So when I did get out, I can actually go to them. Being in prison at a young age, I suppose, being away from my family, it was quite hard. I'm quite resilient as kids, so we just accepted what it is. How did school impact and stuff? Obviously, you were a local boy. You probably went local primary. I know as secondary school, you went to uh, William College, which of course I went to school not far from there, Philip Magnus. 
How did the school, the crowd, the company, how did that affect you, your arrival into crime? For me, I was dyslexia. I wasn't diagnosed then, so I really struggled at school. I couldn't write, I couldn't read, and I really struggled. It was quite embarrassing. That embarrassment made me really angry, and it came out in so many ways. I was really disruptive, and it had a really bad knock effect because someone didn't take the time to actually look at what I was going through because we had quite a big classes and 30 people in the class. And, you know, if you couldn't keep up with everyone else, you were seen as disruptive. And my own embarrassment made me even more disruptive. So it's like, yeah, a double-edged sword for me. I wanted to learn, but I just never got the help that I needed, which then made me angry, which then made me want to be out of school. So I then bunked off, got expelled. I got expelled from probably every school that I went to. That kind of restriction from school and stuff, obviously, and escalation into crime. Things obviously do, you know, in crime tend to take a step up every single time. You know, yeah. and, uh, I'm a firm believer that, you know, people go to prison for one crime and within no space of time they come out with a whole set of new ventures to enter into because people they hear about, people they get to know. As you said, they network, they make contact, you learn about new crimes. What was your next kind of involvement in the crime after coming out of Young Offenders? I went to Young Offenders. I didn't got in trouble for a while and so I ended up knocking someone out. I actually knocked a copper out. And he was a plain close copper. And three or four of his pals jumped me and I had a big terror with them, ended up in the police station. I then ended up getting uh, a year in prison for that. And then I went to Ford. I met a real nice guy, a guy called Stevie. He was an older man, so I was about 18, yeah. He was about 45. And he introduced me to the jump ups. He then mentored me through the six months he was there, showing me how to do certain things, how to be, you know, my confidence. He actually trained me in the art of the jump up. So I went for a bit of violence and then I came out of a professional jump up artist. I took to it like a duck to water, you know, it just seemed, it just was the easiest thing. It was like taking candy from a baby. And, you know, and all of a sudden I'm looking around London. Before when I was walking down the streets, so I was looking, for, you know, for the gold on the floor, which was never there. All of a sudden I'm looking down the road and every van that comes past me, every lorry is like, it's payday. Because I'm just waiting for him to come out. So over that period of time, you know, I learned how to slide down with a, the ignitions on the lorries. I learned how to uh, turn the alarms off. We used to do the tyres on some of the bands. So the guys would walk up to a phone box, we'd cut the phone box wire. We'd let him walk all the way out there. And by the time he went out there, we would cut the lock off his thing, off the back of his van. We would then uh, empty his van and then we'd put another lock on it. And so when he got back, he wouldn't realise that he'd been done twice by doing his tyre and changing his lock. So we'd be gone by the time the old bill got there. Yeah, it was a quite a time in my life. So it'd be fair to say that prison actually served as a college, almost a university then. Definitely. I've done my criminal uh, baptism of fire there, believe me. That's a journey that a lot of young people take, you know, many, many times over, being in the criminal justice system, and people tend to get, you know, further and further involved. There comes a point when you do get a big sentence and you end up in prison and you then sort of know it's now serious, you know? And then it's yeah. an open mechanism for most people. When did that time come? When was that sentence and how did that arrive? What brought that sentence on? You know, what had you done to put that on yourself? How was that sentence involved on the service? Well, you know, for me, I, you know, I'm not a great advocate of rehabilitation within prison. You know, I know it doesn't work. It's a tick box scenario for me, yeah. There's nothing that I've ever done in prison that's changed me. You know, all I've done is learn to go on and do bigger crimes. There's never been a time in my life where... I've actually been in prison and thought anything other than this is just a, a stopgap for me so I can get back out and do more crime. What brought back that sentence? What were you doing at the time? What was your crime? Wrap-ups? The last sentence I just done, I just, like, 17 years, nine months. They called it the Ocean's 11-style heist. We'd go around to bonded warehouses. We were all dressed as police officers and we would serve a warrant on the bond or, or the warehouse where we went. We had dogs, police fans, cars, pull up. And I would just go to the door and say, like, listen, I've got a warrant here to search these premises. We believe there's guns coming into the premises. And for my protection and my officer's protection, I'm going to cover everyone. And that was the start of Ocean and Deliver Star Heist that we've been doing over that period of time. If we go back a bit, you know, for me, the role models in my life were all like Fagans. You know, I remember when I was 21, 22, I met another old gangster. I won't mention their names. They asked me if I wanted to go and do work in Spain. So what I did, I spent quite a few years in Spain driving puff up and down from Marbella to Valencia. i done that for a few years. And that was quite exciting. It moved to me. I was out in a foreign country. It was great. I then moved to Antwerp, Amsterdam. I was working over there for a few years. Came back. 
the drug game was really my game. I was doing lots of cocaine, selling lots of cocaine. I'd made so many really good connections in the game where I knew lots of Colombians. I knew lots of people that wanted it. And from my criminal contacts that I made in prison, the criminal environment that I came from, and from the old area in general that was basically my camden's a party scene for cocaine it then gave me a good starting position to actually get the drugs in myself and then start distributing them so i then became a cocaine distributor and for a number of years i made a hell of a lot of money by two nice asses fortunately both confiscated now the life was really good all this money was coming in and over fist and then i got a look at by the old bill they come in and they shut i had a warehouse in uh, king's cross so i had a curry company there now and next thing i know the old bill come in now, shut us down. I sort of shut the drug trade down. We had to knit it for a little while because we was having lorries coming there with half and then we always, you know, yourself uh, pulling up floors. Yeah, we had to stop. I then went into the cigarette game, got a little warehouse over in Ostend, and then started just bringing uh, cigarettes back for a little while. Uh, so that, that, was, that was my apprenticeship. Yeah, you see, the thing is as well, obviously, I've, I've talked from experience, crime is a very easy thing to kind of, the bigger the crime to come, the lifestyle yeah. comes with it, you know. And yeah. sometimes people say people are addicted to drugs, but the lifestyle, I think, is the biggest addiction that you can have if you step up the ladder and you start to get involved in serious crime and it worked for you for a period of time. How did that lifestyle, do you think, you know, affect your life? You know, what was the impact of that lifestyle during that period of time? What was you drawn by? The money, the power, you know, what things make you believe that I'm not going to get stopped? Because, of course, we believe we were going to get stopped. We wouldn't do it in the first place. We were thinking properly. But what was that drive? You know, we was like the nouveau riche of, of the area. We had nice cars. We were living large. I always, I remember sitting in my bay on the beach and this guy came out with a placard saying, Jesus loves you. Repent. And it's the same sort of thing as rehabilitation. If you've got a guy who's earning loads of money, you ask him to turn his life around because you're turning to him. He ain't going to do it. You've really got to go through what we went through. I was living the high life, but that comes at a price. You know, going out every night and doing the things that we did. You know, when I've got criminal associates, you don't really go to their house. So you need to go to meeting in clubs, pubs, restaurants. That then encourages you to uh, socialise, you know, normally be on your means or, you know, socialise to the extent where you're drinking too much, sniffing gear, talking out of school talking bollocks, basically. That has a knock-on effect on your families. You're not coming home. It's like ruins relationships. That's a knock-on effect on me. You know, the champagne lifestyle lasts for a few years. It's all great. But there's a massive consequence of that lifestyle. Eventually, it catches up to you. Because of the person or the people you love more than anything in this world, that you're telling yourself you're providing for, you're actually neglecting them. Because now all you want to do is say, here's a few quid, darling. Here's a few quid for the kids. A few quid for that. I've got to go and do a bit of business. And that was my life. You know, I was, I was giving the missus money. I was I was sitting in Spain, you know, and I was doing some crazy shit. You know, going to, going to whore houses, I was meeting other birds. And that's what that lifestyle gave me. It made me shallow. It made me an arsehole, basically. You know, that's the consequence of that life. It's good hearing your story because, again, it's something which I've, you know, reflected in my own life. And most people I do know who have, you know, entered into crime we we'll tell that same story, you know. We do need to get people about us. And we lose people as well, you know, on that journey sometimes. And uh, obviously when they're gone, it's too late. Who in your life, there must have been certain people that obviously you had neglected, you left behind and it was too late basically to make amends. I think it has to be your kid. Yeah, everyone else is, uh, you know. I mean, for me, I've got three girls and two boys. I think I seriously let them down because... Everything that I told myself I didn't want to do or I didn't want to be, I then became the person that, that I resented the most, the absent father. It's a selfish guy, you know, the one I only cared about him. In my mind, I was a victim. You know, I kept telling everyone, you know, I was telling myself that I'm a victim. You know, I went in a home, I went in care. You know, at the end of the day, it was me who made that decision. When I got all the money and everything else, it was me that made the decision to do to go out drinking, go out womanising, do cocaine. That was the decision I'm responsible for them. You know, uh, so I think my biggest regret is people I really let down with my kids. And that has, in some respect, helped me change in the future. Well, the big point, obviously, you know, of letting them down uh, would have come with your incarceration, your prison sentence. Yeah. So let's go on that journey, basically. You obviously yeah. the most, you know, recent sentence, um, 
where that started um, and how that kind of, you know, how that developed. When you got nicked, um, how did that journey start? Where did you end up? I got nicked in 2008. I was been on the run for a year. I got nicked in just uh, inside Lee, the lead grave near Luton, walking along the street. You know, I went to the gym every day. I was living large. And this one morning, I thought, well, you know, it's just another day in paradise. I'm walking down the road. Next thing, the whole street came alive with old Bill. You know, I was on the phone to one of my pals in London. And the next thing I knew, this car come and fly to the road, onto the pavement, and there's a brick wall there. And I thought, where the fucking hell is he going? But he then pulled up there. As I looked around, another car came. I jumped in the air, and they both smashed into each other. Next thing, the van pulled up. And all these old bills with bad clavers on come out and like, started weighing me in. At first, I thought I was getting kidnapped. I never knew that was old Bill. When I had the radios going off and said, we got him, we finally got the fucking brick. Then I said it was actually a relief, maybe or not, that they were old Bill and I wasn't a kid now. But it's also a relief for me that I finally got caught. Because being on a run is no fun. You know, you're always looking over your shoulders and as much as you try to convince yourself this is a life and I can do it forever, you know, I was still doing jobs and getting loads of money. But, you know, I wasn't living like normal. I was looking over my shoulder at time. So... Getting Nick for me was, was a massive relief because now I could then get it done, put it aside, do my sentence, come out and start fresh. The journey now is took a different direction because I got nicked. I came back to Kentish Town, spent a couple of days in the cell and they put me in Hillville. About four or five days later, they'd done me on a deduction. I had to go back to the police station. They took me to Ivory and Islington police station, but it was shut. Then I went to Kentish Town. I was in cuffs and that. I said, okay, no problem. I'll, uh, Let's go, put my hands over the cuff, and they put the handcuffs on. So they got outside, I feel that the handcuffs would, would slide off me. So I'm sitting in the van on the way up to uh, to the hands like this one in Tottenham. And I'm having a conversation with the old Bill. They're telling me, if, you know, that I'm going to go away forever, so I need to pull my mates in there. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, I'm going to be out here in five minutes. And the minute that door opens, I'm going to go. We've, we've got to St. Anne's, and I'm joking with this guy. I said, you know what? As much as I like to stay, I'm going to be fucking home by dinner time, you know? And because in my head, I'd already escaped. We pulled up at St. Anne's, and I was pretty lucky. There was two police cars. Uh, one of them parked up. No one got out. The other one parked against the wall, and I was in a van. But none of them got out. So I've got, now I've got three cops with me, old Bill. One of them's really massive, but he's driving. He's gone to the door, knocked on the door. He's gone in. I think lucky. I couldn't get any more lucky than this. I'm with two guys in their 40s, 50 years old, and I'm thinking, right, I'm just going to do them both, and I'm going to get out of here. One starts reading the paper, the other one opens the door, and I'm out. On the chin, I'm flying around the corner, I'm thinking, I'm free. All I've got to do is get over a fence. It's a 10-foot fence and a 15-foot wall. I'm flying now. As I come around, about 20, 30 foot in front of me, a three-old bill come through the gate. I'm thinking, fuck, I've run and jumped on the gate, on the wall, pulled myself up, thinking I'm over this. And all of a sudden, bam, in my back, someone whacked me, someone put their arm behind my back, and I've hit the floor. We had a little bit of a tear up. I've got three broken ribs, busted eye. And then I end up back in Pentonville in the patches, now an escape prisoner. But the best thing that came out of it, because of what I did and, and also my crime, that they actually said, listen, there's something really not right with you, Tell. We're going to let you see a psychologist. We believe it's going to do you the world of good. And I've said, you know what? Job on. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, this lady came and saw me. We started talking and... Uh, you know, for the first time in my life, I, I just started talking to someone about being dyslexic. I started talking to someone about being put in a home. And all the things I normalised as a kid, you know, criminality, being in care, you know, I realised that, you know what, you know, this had a massive effect on my life. So for a year I spent in Pentonville. You know, I didn't got moved to Rye Hill uh, with a load of my friends and things were going really great. Then I met three old guys, you know, they always changed my life. I knew them from dad because they were all old arm ones. You know, it was all in there. One was 50. I think no, one was 50 saying, one was 60, and one was nearly 70 years old. They were all proper old villains. And they just got done for uh, robbing a security van. And the old Bill had done a ready eye. They were going to shoot them. Thank God for them. They saw the old Bill and ran into a safe or a test at the time. They laid on the floor. I'm listening to their stories and I'm thinking, you know, do I really want some young kids to actually start looking at me? Like I'm looking at them now thinking, are they heroes or are they just. And they just mugs because they just wasted, they're going to waste another 10 or 15 years of their life and nick it 25 grand out of a van. But for me, that was a turning point in my life. But I decided then to go to Grendon, you know, and take a really good look at myself. Now, Grendon, again, is another prison, obviously. It's a very small prison. 
as you said, it's about complete rehabilitation. A part of what we will get to, obviously, you've written a book related to your time now. But tell us a little about that journey at Grendon. For me, is 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 you know, I went I went to Grendon. I think it was about challenging myself. I had a misconception of Grendon, as you know, it's full of uh, serial killers, rapists, pedophiles, and all manner of despicable crime. But for me, going there as an armed robber, I just really wanted to challenge my mindset. That is a challenging environment. You know, the journey through there. It was one of discovery for me. The first time in my life I was able to uh, talk about the things that really affected my life and actually get them out. It was really important just to speak and feel myself getting that, see that anger that I carried for so long. Just being able to speak, I felt the anger go. You know, we do the therapies we did there, you know, we've done a lot of you know, anger management, computational therapies, cognitive therapies, art therapy, psychodrama becoming more empathetic towards other people. That was great. And, you know, I think a hell of a lot about myself, you know, the shame, the shame I carried from being dyslexic. I realised that the shame wasn't physically going to hurt me. So now I can actually put my head over the parapet wall and actually start saying, now, yeah, this is it. I've got dyslexia. I'm not ashamed of it no more. So now I can now get help. Because where I was hiding all the time and trying to avoid situations, everyone knew. So it was really a good place for me to be because now I could just, I could be honest and open. I could own all my shit, so to speak. So going now, I own that. That was another thing. I worked on my ego. You know, I had a massive ego for years. You know, being a criminal, we have massive egos. I, you know, I'd be the first person to say, yeah, I'm there. I'd do that. If someone had a job to do, you know, drive up from Spain with a four or five hundred care puff, I'd probably do it. I had this problem. I always had to be the one that was, was the first one into a job as well, be the last one out. I was always trying to prove myself. So, you know, working on my ego was a massive thing. Also working on embarrassment. You know, going to Grendon really gave me an opportunity to actually deal with my past so I then can create a different future for myself and, and actually move on. I found that once I dealt with everything, I was actually so stronger mentally. I didn't have to sort of self-medicate and sort of spend a life feeling sorry for myself. I knew what I'd done with my life. I knew how I got there. I just didn't know how to move on. Grendon gave me an opportunity to move on by dealing with all the problems. But once I dealt with everything, you know, it's still there. I'm not completely fixed. Um, but it gave me an opportunity to, uh, to empower myself. So now I came out of prison, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't mess around no more because I know the impact that has on me uh, as a result of doing Grendon. I think it really changed my life. You know? So, you know, you feel some really, really interesting points now. As you said, in Grendon, obviously, it was a massive turning point for you, you know. Arriving at DCAT now, how did that journey, how did you feel arriving at DCAT first of all? I know for me personally, it was a surreal moment when I actually looked, uh, you know, and I wasn't being handcuffed to a guard and I could see the street and cars passing by, you know, and uh, that was coming from a category A prison at the beginning of my sentence. Yeah. yeah. How did that feel to you to uh, be have that freedom? After being away for uh, seven and a half years, to come into Spring Hill and getting out of the van with no handcuffs on is a moment I'll never forget. Going into the office and someone calling me by my first name, Terry, was another one. I can remember being put in a heart, which wasn't ideal. You know, when you've got a twos up with someone, that then got my back up straight away going now. For many years, you know, when you're in prison, you're in a single cell. And I think being in with someone took me back to when I first went in prison. You know, everything that like you take sacred to yourself, like uh, going to the toilet. You know, you've now got to do all the things that you never show that, that side of you. You're now doing it in front of someone you don't even know. So you've got to go to the toilet and then now you've actually got to go, you've got to eat there, you've got to smell their farts, their BO, their breath, their cigarettes. So going into Spring Hill and being banged up with someone took me back to that place. I've been in a single cell. Like all the time you've been in prison, you've got your own peace of mind, your own space. It's worth its weight in gold and all of a sudden you have to bang up with someone. It was like the most amazing experience of my life. But it's also tinged with torture. So I'm now having to be in a cell with someone that snores, doesn't clean the place up. It's hygienically not the same as me. It's messy. It was a psychological nightmare for me going there. I was at the point where I wanted to say, you know what? As much as I want my freedom, I want to be out in a decat. I would give it all up because of this. You know, this we're in the 20th century. You know, why can't we have a single huts? You know, with single single bullets. You know, you can actually yeah, shut that door and actually you have your own peace of mind. You know, you're still being treated like an animal. And then the way they obfuscate that is to say, you know what? This is about testing you. This is about testing your mantle. 
so you don't attack that person or anything else. It's simply a fact that they're just not prepared to actually spend any money on, on Spring Hill. But that's another story. I can always remember going out onto the field at six o'clock, half six in the morning on my first morning in, uh, in Spring Hill and going down and doing some pull-ups. And it was such a surreal moment. I just looked up and an owl came flying out of the trees there. There's a little forest there and it came out and it just flew past me. And I can remember doing both. This is so, this is amazing. You know, I just waited seven, seven and a half years for this. And this is a moment I'll never forget. You know, it's like, it was surreal. And, you know, I had all hope then. Like, it just came to me. You know, I'm going to turn my life around. I'm going to do everything in my power to succeed. I'm going to get a job in the next three or four weeks. I'm going to get a rent deposit scheme. And I'm going to go back into society, a changed man. And how was that journey? Because obviously you had your first home leave. That would have been experience. Getting back to society yeah. after seven and a half years. Ready to get getting towards your release. It was great. All these things to look forward to. Unfortunately, it didn't actually pan out of way. I'm actually a qualified plaster. I actually used to teach it in the man. You know, they used all my skills there. But when I went to Spring Hill and said, I'm a plaster, I'd like to go outside and do some plastering. They said, I'm sorry, you can't go out. There. You can't go out and earn money to get a rent your policy. I said, why? Because first of all, we have to go through another process with you. You've done your oasis. You've been deemed fit to come to it here. You passed all the criteria to come here. Unfortunately, you have to now to go through a solid psychological test, which you don't have to be there. You have to send the paper off to a psychologist, deem whether you're allowed to go out into the community. So that then took another five months, you know, which was a joke. So I missed the first five months. I couldn't go out and get a job. I couldn't do nothing. I was working in the hut, cleaning the hut. I mean, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to try and sort my housing out and try and find somewhere to live. So I contacted the council. Uh, they said I couldn't put my name down. I only had four or five months to go. So that was a waste of time. But I went to the CRC that's in all the prisons. They'd done their normal bit and said, like, you know what? Don't worry, we're going to find you a place. It's going to be rosy. You know, unfortunately, when you've been in prison for a number of years, you see men coming back time and time again because they've been let down right the last hurdle. And the CRC is another establishment, really, that is not fit for purpose, as you probably know. When you go into a decap prison, you walk in there, the CRC come there with all their paperwork and all their forms, and they say, sign this, sign this. Even if you've got somewhere to live, you've still got to sign it. Even if you've got a partner, you've still got to sign it. And the people that have got nowhere to live have still got to do it. So they do the whole 300 men coming through there at one time, knowing full well that they can't actually do anything. So that's the first audit. And the last three months before you leave, they come again and you do another form-filling exercise. And then they tell you, you know what? Between me and you, there's actually nothing that we can do because there's not enough time, three months, to actually get you anywhere to live. And this is what we're up against as prisons. I'm just going to go fast forward to when I got out, you know, just for a minute. I can remember going uh, to sort out my housing, which failed spectacularly. I then went to the reception and I was told that, you know, to get a travel warrant, I need to give an address. And I said, well, I haven't got an address. So they said there's actually nothing, they haven't got a process to actually uh, let me go and no fix the boat. So for my own benefit, so I could get a travel warrant and get let out, I had to give an address. Any address will do. So what they wanted me to do, they wanted me to give any address. So that's classed as a successful rehab. So I refused, of course. I then went on to the main reception on the last day. They said, this is my bags. I'm, I want to leave. And they said, where are you moving to? I said, I'm going back to London. I'm going to go to the council. I want to find somewhere to live. And they said, where are you living? I said, I haven't got nowhere to live. Well, they said, well, you can't leave prison. I said, why not? I'm going to get a travel warrant, and then you're going to let me go. This is, you know, I've done my sentence. But they said, we haven't got anything in place. You have to give us a address. So it really surprised me that they've actually got a 93% success rate of Riaz and expenditures. Simply because everyone that leaves here, just to leave prison, gives them an address. This is a massive failing for us as prisoners and a massive failing for society in general, simply because society is being led to believe that they've got a 93% success rate of rehousing men. We as prisoners know they've got a 0% success of rehousing men, simply because everything that they've taught us about rehabilitation and talking the truth, they're now lying to the general public by saying they're rehousing. So it's, it's a real, you know, you leave there. You know, all the hope that you had for changing your life around sort of gets skewed at that moment in time where you think, hold up, you're supposed to help me, but you're lying. You know, if that makes any sense to you. So you just hit a big trigger there. And um, one of the things, well, obviously, resettlement and rehousing of offenders is one of the biggest yeah. problems. It's greatest lie. We know that as former prisoners that are sold to us and uh, giving out a tense as well. You know, I understand you, obviously, 
and experienced that as well. Well, you know, I actually got in touch with my probation officer the last year I got to uh, Spring Hill. I was actually told, Terry, get in touch with me about three months before you leave because you know what? There's nothing I can do for you. And I probably won't even be your probation officer. So three months before I left, I got in touch with the probation officer. I had a different probation officer. And I said, I need somewhere to live. They said like, they couldn't do nothing for me. But they said, look, it's really important that you give us your postcode of the bench where you're living so we can get in contact with you. So, you know, when you're up against that mentality, you know, and all you want to do is a scream for the, you know what, I've just done Grendon. I've just done eight and a half years in prison. All I want is somewhere to put my stuff and have a bit of security, in a, you know, somewhere that I can actually put my head down so I can then go out and get a job. I can give a bank the details of where I live just so I can just start my life. All of a sudden, I'm thinking, hold on a minute, I've done everything they've asked me. I've done the most grueling two and a half years in Grendon that is anyone can imagine. And now I'm being set up to fail by my own probation officer. He never set me up well coming out that day. I can always remember phoning someone. They actually brought a tent up for me. That was me living in prison with a blue tent. There are two similar episodes I personally know of inmates. One, given a tent. He went to the off-license, bought a bottle of vodka, drank it, and put the bottle through the off-license window so he could go straight back in. Another one, yeah. was given a tent, he decided he was going to creep back into the prison at night and decided to pitch the tent on the football pitch at Stanford Hill. So what yeah. you're saying is completely right. So, you know, I think we both have to agree. They do let us down. You've moved on. Uh, you've written a book. Let's, yeah. you know, tell us a little about that book which you've written because, you know, you've... I'll let me show you first, yeah? yeah. You right. see that? It's called Living Amongst the Beasts. It's just about my journey through Brendan and all the conflicts I had to put myself through to actually get to the other end. It's about change, it's about redemption, it's about, it's about getting in touch with my empathy. It's also about, it's about tolerance, it's about conflict resolution. There's just so much more that I learned there. You know, I don't know if you've heard the expression, uh, he's a 57-year-old kid, or mm-hmm. he's a 50-year-old you know, kid, he's never grown up. So what Grendon done and, and the book shows you is that we have to teach people, even men, to actually conduct their lives in a way that, that fits in with uh, society. And the only way to do that is actually for them to change. And for me, get in touch with my empathy by becoming a victim of arson and being callous. Terry, also, you know, we have to admire what you've done since you've from prison. You've been working with various charities in the sector. Yeah. Band of Brothers, I know, is one. Camden Against Violence, another one. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that journey, how that came about? I came out of prison, you know, became a born-again Christian. And for me, I want to give something back. It was a spat of killings and knifings in Queen's Crescent where I live in Camden Town. So we decided to organise a march, first of all, and then we organised Camden Against Violence where, where people could come together as, a, as an organisation. So I think we had about 3,500 members of the last shot, all mothers in the area. We wanted to give them a platform where they feel safe to talk about their thoughts and feelings. Um, and also we had a platform where outside charities could come on board to do courses so we could give the kids an opportunity to say, right, you know, you can either stay on the streets and you can carry on with this life, taking drugs, selling drugs or whatever, or you can actually take control of your lives. You know, we've got courses here, painting, decorating, English, anything you want to do, we can facilitate that. So we set up Camden Against Violence. We got ourselves an office. We've got three girls running. They're fantastic. Uh, Rennie, Michelle and Marion are fantastic girls. And now we can we channel you know, only the kids that want to change because unfortunately not everyone wants to change. We live in a society now, unfortunately, where there's no social housing. We've got the highest rents in probably Europe now. And, you know, we've got zero contract out. So it's nothing really to aspire to. If you've got a job where you're just existing, that's nothing that's going to infuse a kid to actually go and do. But if you're, if you're going to a couple hundred quid a week working in McDonald's or working in a job and your rent is 200 quid and you are just existing because now you've got to get a night job to actually feed yourself, you're not living, you're existing. So... Someone comes along as a drug dealer and tells you that I've got a bit of gear here that I want you to look after and sell. And what you're going to do, you're going to earn maybe 150 quid a night and then you're going to earn me the X amount of money. But I can do this every single week for you. Which choices are you going to make? Are you going to listen to me that's telling you to empower yourself and go and do the courses? And at the end of it, when you've done the courses, you can get a job for 100 quid a week and live to exist, just to exist. Or you're going to listen to this guy who's going to give you 500 quid or 700 quid a week and live like, like a normal person. So. It's a really hard battle that we're fighting at the moment because there's no incentive by governments or anything to change anything. You know, we're having social housing or developments in this area that are just 
all being given over to private landlords. Any development that gets made, we get you know, you know, ten or twelve percent of social housing. With that comes a back door, so you have the people that buy the places, and you let the council tenants will have a back door, and the private tenants will have a front door. So now we've got a class system in this area where we've had something gentrified, and the kids see that, so they resent that. So we're up against that. So you've got pockets of council estates in this area where it's just controlled by the gangs, drug dealing, and it flourishes really well for them. You know, how you then change that mindset of a kid, it's really hard. You know, what I do, I talk to them about prison. I tell them what's going to come, how dangerous it is in there, the smells, as I've explained. 23-hour day bang up, and if you're lucky, that our exercise and the food, you know. The ones that I do turn around, I can send that one. But that's accessory, it's very, very, very small. But you know what? It's about trying. If I can do it, my three girls I work with do it, and all the other volunteer organisations do it. We're trying to save lives and we're trying to save people. We're trying to put them in the right direction. Because no one else is going to do it. There's not the will to change it. You mentioned your faith. Obviously, you have very, very, very strong faith. I'm a born-again Christian. Yeah. How did that happen? Because obviously in prison, faith is a big thing. There's a very, very high population that obviously converts to Islam. There are lots of people, obviously, who do attend the various church and Catholic services. How did you kind of, you know, get on that path? What took you down? I just want to cover this uh, conversion for a second, yeah? We've always had gangs in prison. And whoever's got the biggest gang gets the load of members, yeah? We used to have the white gangs, and we have the black gangs, we have the Asian gangs, and now we have the Muslim gangs. It doesn't matter what crime you, you commit. If you want to join a Muslim gang, all you have to do is wash your heart. I know lots of guys that I've spoken to over the years, and I say to them, why have you become a Muslim inside prison? They say, because I need protection. You know, because these guys have said to me, I look after you. You have to put yourself in the shoes of someone who goes to the prison on their own. It's violent in there, intimidating. And all of a sudden, you've got two people come to you or one person come to you and say, listen, brother, I want to show you something. I want to show you some faith. I want to educate you into this and this. But you know what? You're going to be my brother now. You know, and then you've got the cold screw. And then you've got the other gangs that don't want to know you. And what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to go for that cold shoulder hug or that cuddle and that embrace from someone who's going to guide you. And this is what's happening time and time again. I used to speak to these guys afterwards, after a year and everything, and, you know, they were going down to the mosque and they were praying, and I said, how's, how's it going for you? And they go, you know what? Oh, fuck, it's, it's, it's driving me mad. But I've got to keep going every week because if I don't, I'll be cast out and I'll probably end up getting done, you know? So for me, I felt there was a lack of responsibility by the prisons to allow this to happen because, you know, you're getting vulnerable young people going in there. And these guys are getting radicalised and then they're getting churned out on the street. I'm not saying that everybody who gets radicalised inside prison goes on to be a partner because that's not the case. But if they're giving out this warm embrace and people uh, respond to that, then why isn't the prison doing exactly the same but doing it in a positive way? Embracing them with education, embracing them with an opportunity to get somewhere to live when they get out, and embracing them with an opportunity to get a job. You know, these guys are supplying warmth, companionship, friendship. The prison system is supplying a bed, bang up, and no hope. And a tick box a rehabilitation system that hasn't worked for over 100 years and continues to fail spectacularly. You know, I think anyone who's ever done any courses in prison, every life I've ever met in prison would tell you, tell, these courses are not worth the paper they're written on. We have to do them and we have to maintain the illusion and the perception that to our probation officers and everyone in Sundry that is looking in at us, that we actually can change it. You know, that's why we're doing these courses. We wait 18 months to do a six week or a five week course that hasn't got any bearing on normal life and changing life. So you're doing this. If you imagine going into a prison classroom, just yourself, you know, and uh, someone asks you 50 questions. And, you know, you have never read up on them questions. You never discussed them questions. You ain't going to know. And all of a sudden, they say, right, these are the questions, and they look at you, and you can't answer them. You've got a bit of paper in your hand. And then six weeks later, they ask you the same questions that they've just taught you for the last six weeks, and then you answer that bit of paper again. Because they've made you for the last six weeks with them questions, you then tick, 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 now you've changed. This is how stupid prison is. They ask you questions you don't know. They then tell you the answers to them. You then tick the boxes, and that's supposed to be changed. That's crazy. This happens on every single course, r and ETS, you name it, conflict, it's anger management, the works. 
it's done work. But you know, for years and years and years, we've been rolling them out. These courses are created by people in suits that have no perception of that rehabilitation whatsoever. It's just a tick box scenario. Basically, what it is, if you've got an outside agency like the CRC, who's supposed to house, yeah, you've got all the education departments that are supposed to rehabilitate them. When you foul spectacularly, they won't blame themselves. They would blame the CRC because they fouled you. They would blame the service provider because they found you. It's just a revolving door of recidivism, going back inside, simply because we shift the blame to everybody else, the service providers, basically. So we should really get all them. We should have the MOGA create a system where people can go inside prison. There's no shareholders. There's no CEOs. There's no incentive to just get bums on seats and do tick box. This going to prison, this have a fundamental change. We've got geezers or people going to prison that have got degrees, they've got diplomas, they've been to the best education in money can buy. And they've abused that. They've abused everything, they've had everything, and then they go inside the prison. But the first thing they all do when they get there, because it's such an easy life, and the prison perpetuates it, they put them into the education. So you've got 10 classes for the people that have all got great, great educations. Never going to come back in prison, but they're tick boxing everything. They're seen as manageable, everything else. The other 40% of the revolving door of recidivism, they're on the landing, sweeping and, and, and doing the drugs and everything else. These ones that keep coming in and out. We need to have a policy inside prison where we go, right, you've been to college, you've had all the advantages, you go over there, you put tea bags in bags and you do the popping up. 40% of people that are on drugs, the people that can't read, the people that got dyslexia, let's concentrate on these guys because they're the ones that keep coming back. We need to empower these guys. We need to get them either on courses, plastering, carpentry, bricklaying, computer stuff, not rail track. Everyone thinks that every person that goes in prison wants to aspire to being a labourer. <laughs> Do you know what? I've met some of the most brainiest people. They're the best cons. They're very articulate. Even drug dealers. You know, most of the drug dealers I know are very entrepreneurial. But we train them and the people that have got the big IQs, we train them to be labourers. You know, it's crazy because that's what we think of prisoners. We need to empower prisoners with proper structured education, proper courses that's going to bring the best out of them. So when they do leave prison, they're not leaving with a 10 and they're not leaving with no hope. You know, there's a very small window of opportunity when you leave prison because you promise everyone before you come out, your wife, your kids, your boyfriend, whatever you've got out there waiting for your mum and dad, mum, dad, I'm going to change. This is changing me to sense. You know, I'm going to get a job. I'm going to go to my probation officer. I'm going to sort that, blah, blah, blah. As soon as you get out of there, you know, real life issues come and, and just whack you down. You know what I mean? You know, they're on you straight away. Face, you can't do nothing. You can't get a job. You know, and you go to the job centre and it takes six weeks to get any money. So that 50 quid that you got let out of the prison with just goes within a couple of days. And then you're sitting there. The three or four years you've done in prison, it was a blur because you forget it very quickly. Aren't you? you know, it doesn't matter how long you do, you forget it. The minute you walk out of there, you've gone, that's gone. And all of a sudden you've got no money. You're probably living on someone's city who's taking drugs, who's got mental health problems, and you're thinking, fuck it, how do I get out of this? Do I go back to what I know? You know, am I going to go back in the drug game? Am I going to do a post office or a bank? Because I'm not going to live here and stand in this position with nowhere to live. <laughs> no, no prospects of enhancing my future because everyone that said they were going to do things as me has let me down. Because that's the real reality of prison and the criminal justice. It just sets you up to foul spectacularly. You know, if you haven't got a good network of people outside, Family is going to give you somewhere to live and give you some money. You've got nothing. Coming out of prison with no one, you are left on the heat. And that's when you go back inside. This is why geezers are putting their tents on football pitches inside prisons. That's the reality of prison, you know. True words, my brother. True, true words. Well, Terry, it's a pleasure to um, have you today behind the door. Um, I would suggest everyone to go out and buy the book. As I said, it's yeah. truly it will empower you by reading it and getting to understand your journey. As I say, it's been a remarkable one. Um, thank you. Once again, thank you, Terry, and I wish you all the best of luck in the world. Just one thing before you go. We launched a book on Wednesday. We've sold about 200 so far. The most of the thing that's come out of it is the amount of people that have come to me who are victims of abuse and seeing what I've gone through now and how I've empowered myself to move on and create a better future for myself and my family. They're actually coming now and they're actually speaking on my website my Facebook page, and they're engaging now. And I've had two girls in the last few days say they actually want to write a book about their experiences of going through a lifetime of abuse. So, you know, just going back to the book again, 
I hope you get a chance to read it. It took me over a year to write. As I said, I've got dyslexia, but every single word in here is mine and every experience that I went through, I hope will help others change their lives because you have to have the desire to change. You know, you really have to have the desire. There's no formula for change. All of a sudden, it just comes, there's a point in your life where it's faith, it's embarrassment, it's your kids. And all at one time, it aligns. And all of a sudden, you get to that stage in your life, you know what, this is the time. It's just about knowing when that time is and actually being, there's someone out there who's going to help you, like your foundation, going to create an opportunity for people coming out of prison. That's all we need. Just a small point. Most men that come out of prison, they do armed robberies, they fire everything else. Do you know the biggest thing that they're scared of is being rejected and going for a job? You know, how scared that most men are walking into a place They've been surrounded by the hardest men and not being qualified for that job or just walking in there thinking, I'm not good enough. That embarrassment is enough for them to go back out and do so. They'd rather go inside prison for four or five years and actually walk into an office and actually ask for a job because they don't want to feel rejection. So it's really important that we organise a programme inside prison that empowers men before they get out. We need people to go inside prison and give them proper jobs, fundamental jobs that they can earn a living at. And get that self-worth before they leave prison. Because you know what? When they leave, they've been let down from the dole, the housing, probation, everything. They're not going to come back in. You're not going to get them. So we need to do it inside prison. I don't want to go on. Really? But, uh, I think it's really imperative. Yeah. We, we have organisations like yourself go in prison and actually do something that actually benefits prisoners, not benefits their pockets. Because there's a lot of people earning so much money inside prison. Loads of little organisations that get £49 for a letter. You come and see them in a hut, another 39 quid. The CRC get £2,600 for doing three forms. The same three forms they did at the beginning when I went there. They're getting hundreds, not millions of pounds a year. But they can't even do a referral to housing. We need organisations that say exactly what they can do. If a man comes to you, says, I want a job, I want a house, I want to do education, why can't we do them three fundamental things to empower that guy to go out and change his life? Why do we spend £130,000 a year putting someone into the criminal justice system and then £40,000 a year keeping them in there. But the minute we, they actually ask for help, we say, we can't do nothing because you're not convicted anymore. We need to set something out and spend that forty grand that they would have spent in prison and, and empower them. Get them the job, link the job with an education, a job and somewhere to live and put it all in one umbrella and then monitor them going through. That's what we should be doing, but we just let them go with tents. I was so lucky that I had a brilliant family around me and brilliant friends. I didn't slip through that now. But you know what? I was that far away from it. If I would have slipped back in, I would never have helped set up the Camden Against Violence. I would never set up the Band of Brothers. I would never have become an ambassador for the Forward Trust. I would never have wrote a book. I would never have helped all the kids in this area that I do on a weekly basis and the mothers that I speak to because I would have gone back inside. There's so much potential in people, even yourself, if you know this. If we were just given the opportunities, I was lucky. I was able to do this. It was like an on and off switch. I could have gone straight back in. But I was lucky. It was luck. It wasn't anything to do with the criminal justice system or anything else. Pure 100% luck that I went on this path and done what I did. This is the problem with coming out of prison. We need something structured for the guys. As well. Good, really, my brother. We'll find it and we'll try to help people do it. Right. I, I look forward to speaking to you again, yeah? <laughs> Definitely. Pleasure speaking Thank to you. Thank you very much. If you or anyone you know is being affected by any of the issues mentioned in this video, or if you'd like to be involved, please contact us via email, visit our website, or talk to us on social media. Links to all will be in the description.